So, um, all right, this is what I'm going to talk about. And um, let me start with, well, I'm really happy to be here to honor Luke. Uh, I've known him and admired him for quite a while now. Um, and maybe in another half century, we can do it again. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with um, Vam Hutiap and Antonio Rojas Leon. And uh, let me start with um, reminding you of Abianker's insight, which goes back to around 1957. So, um, If you have a, um, an open Riemann surface of genus G, then um, the fundamental group is a free group on um, 2G plus one less than the number of punctures um, free generators. And actually I tried to um, track down exactly when this um, became a theorem and um, it's a little bit hard. I mean, it, it's by 1930, it's written down somewhere, but I, I couldn't find anything before that, but I, I'm, I can't believe that it took that long um, for this to be known. In any case, um, so that was a, so Abiyankar says, well, what happens if you're in characteristic P? So again, um, an open Riemann surface, um, but you're in characteristic P. So he says, well, the problem is about um, the characteristic P. So he says, take the subgroup generated by all the PC law subgroups uh, for your finite group, or equivalently by all the elements of the subgroup generated, the normal subgroup generated by all elements of p-power order, or equivalently, it's the subgroup, um, it's minimal subgroup such that if you divide out by it, you'll get a group of order prime to p. Okay. So now Bianca's idea is that um, the condition that a finite group G be a quotient of pi one of this, this open curve in characteristic P is that if you divide it by um, its, this, so to speak, P part, this G sub P, um, that should be what you get. In other words, if you have a finite group which divided by its P part um, is generatable by the correct number of elements, then it should occur as a quotient of uh, a finite quotient of pi one of this open curve in characteristic P. So if it's the affine line, which uh, over the complex numbers is simply connected, then it's saying that um, the condition is that G should be equal to the subgroup generated by its uh, PC laws. Um, if you're on the multiplicative group, it's, it's the groups that if you divide by this, this P subgroup, uh, you just have a cyclic group, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the key case was the case of the affine line uh, and that was proven by Raynaud and then um, was extended to the general case by Harbader and with a different argument um, by Pop. So it, it's, that's something we know. Okay. So then the question becomes, suppose we're in characteristic P and um, we're given a group that um, according to the theorem, can occur in characteristic P. So take it, take some complex, take a faithful complex representation of it. And then you say, okay, it's a finite group. So this complex representation of course lands in, in GLN of some number field. And um, if you embed the number field into um, some aliotic field, then um, you can compose, 
you can think of the, the group inside this, this, this GL, and you can compose with the, uh, the fact that the pi one maps onto this finite group. So altogether, you get a homomorphism from this pi one to uh, uh, some elatic GLN. And tautologically, a, a continuous representation of pi one um, is what we call a local system. Okay, a least sheaf, a least elatic sheaf of rank N on this open curve. Okay, with this extra property that it's monodromy group is um, actually this finite subgroup of the GL. And I mean, L here, what I've said so far, L, L could be the characteristic. That, that doesn't matter, it's a true statement. But um, if we want to use a lot of cohomology, which we do, then we'll always take, we'll, we'll choose an L which is different from the characteristic. Okay. So that's, that's the, the, the story that we want to investigate. So now I want to talk about, um, so to speak, working backwards. So instead of starting from a group, let's talk about local systems that um, we can somehow try to deal with. So first of all, our, our curve over the algebraically closed field um, will be interested only in cases where um, it comes from something over a finite field. And we'll, we'll want to have um, a local system on the curve over the finite field. Um, we'll take it to be geometrically irreducible. And we'll also take it to be pure of some way. And I mean, in, in fact, um, using Laforgue, the, the pure of some way is automatic, but I'm going to assume it explicitly. And in, in the, at least certainly in the examples I'm going to talk about, um, we'll know the trace function. We'll know what the traces of Frobenius are um, at any point in any finite extension. Um, in this local system. And know it means that we can compute it in some, we can compute it on a computer, have a formula in that sense. And at least in the cases I'm gonna talk about, the, the, the trace will a priori um, line a, a cyclotomic integer ring. In fact, uh, the only P part will be that we have a Pth root of unity, and then um, we have some root of unity um, which we can call Q minus one, Q being a, in a power of P. And so, but basically um, a cyclotomic integer ring where um, the P part is just from P roots of unity. Okay, so then some general business, um, whenever you have a um, local system on, on a curve over a finite field um, and you look at its determinant. So that's a, a rank one thing. Um, and because you started over a finite field, this rank one thing geometrically is, is a finite order. So we know that. And so if we do a, what a, a suitable constant field twist, um, we can make this determinant not just geometrically a finite order, but arithmetically a finite order. And the cases we're gonna look at um, are when the, the way you, the, the constant field twist you need to choose, you need to twist by is just the, the correct power of the square root of Q. The power of the square root of Q that makes the weight come out to be zero. So, This twist by the, the right power of the square root of Q will always make the thing pure of weight zero, but it, it may or may not make the determinant arithmetically a finite order. But we're gonna talk about um, 
cases where where the square the correct power of the square root of few does the job. So assuming that we're in that case, then we can, um, in particular, pay attention to the the geometric monodromy group, which means there's a risky closure of the image of the geometric monodromy, the image of the pi, pi one of the geometric curve um, for this local system. Of course, the geometric group doesn't care whether you did the twist or not. And then, um, but what does care a lot about what twist you did is the Zariski closure of the image of the, the arithmetic pi one, the, the literal pi one of the curve over the finite field. And, um, Basically, by, by the, the global version of the local monodromy theorem, this G geometric group um, is actually a semi-simple group, meaning its identity component is semi-simple. So that's that's the theorem that if you if you start um, say with a geometrically irreducible local system. Um, so the tautologically, this G geometric is um, has it's given with it faithful um, irreducible representation. So a priori, it's a reductive group, and um, what's keeping it from being semi-simple is um, that maybe you could have a unipotent radical, and the um, so to speak the this global version is that the unipotent radical is trivial. In other words, if the group is reductive, then it's semi-simple. And then you look at the relation between um, G geometric and G arithmetic. So if the smaller group, um, well, if the arithmetic group is finite, since it contains the geometric group, the geometric one is finite. And conversely, since the arithmetic group normalizes the geometric group, so the arithmetic group um, itself is going to be finite because you look at how it normalizes and um, the information you lose is from the center. The center has to be scalars because we're irreducible, but there can't be many scalars because the determinant is arithmetically a finite order. So the situation is that we have these two groups, um, one sits in the other, but they're finite or not together. And the, the finiteness that's um, most accessible is that of the arithmetic group, because there, there's a, um, so to speak, number theoretic criterion that um, the condition for the arithmetic group to be finite is that all the traces, all Frobenius traces, are algebraic integers. So it's obvious that if the if if the group is finite, then what we're looking at is um, these Frobenius these Frobenius elements are these conjugacy classes in this finite group. So of course they have traces. Um, which are um, some kind of cyclotomic integers because they're, they're uh, traces of elements of, of a finite group inside a, an ambient GL. Um, and the, this slightly subtle part is that if in fact these Frobenius traces are all algebraic integers, then, um, then you have finiteness. And the argument there is that um, If these, eigenval if these traces are algebraic integers, then the Frobenius eigenvalues are going to be algebraic integers. But um, by purity, these algebraic integers are going to be roots of unity. So that means that every Frobenius um, has eigenvalues that are roots of unity. Now, where are these roots of unity? Well. This Eladic system lives in some finite extension of QL, so in, in some usual Eladic field. Um, 
the characteristic polynomial for Banius has some degree, the rank of the system, degree n over that field. So these eigenvalues are in a fixed finite extension of this l field. So they're in a fixed other l field, but they're roots of unity. So they're roots of unity of some bounded order, say 700, <laughs> just to pick a number. So now you know that the 700th power of every Frobenius is unipotent. Now the Frobenii are dense, so you know that every element in your arithmetic group has the property that um, its 700th power is unipotent. Now the, the arithmetic group contains the geometric group, so in the geometric group, the 700th power of every element is unipotent. But the geometric group is a semi-simple group. So um, in a maximal torus, you would know that every element has a 700th power, which is unipotent, which means there is no maximal torus, or rather it's trivial. And um, then the geometric group is finite, and therefore the arithmetic group is finite. So that's how you go back and forth. Okay. And now if we look at what the trace is in terms of our local system before we did the twisting, um, we're, we're computing that trace, which is some kind of cyclotomic integer. And then for the, by the twist, we're dividing by um, this power of the uh, cardinality of the finite field. So now that, that power is just, it's, it's some power of P. So in other words, what you need is the um, P integrality of these divider traces. So the, the condition for the finite G arithmetic or equivalently finite G geometric is it's a piatic condition uh, on these traces. Um, they lie in a fixed number field and for each piatic place of that number field, you need, um, you need this inequality. Okay. So step one in the sort of general program I want to describe is, okay, find interesting local systems. And when you find one, um, either prove that the arithmetic group is finite or prove that it's not. In other words, decide if it's finite or not. Um, and step three, if it's finite, figure out what the, what the groups are. If it's not finite, also figure out what the groups are. Okay, so it's a, sort of a three-step program to keep you busy. All right, so now um, I'm gonna give three different instances of um, some interesting irreducible local systems on some open curves. So in general, we're, we're gonna, it's gonna, in, we're gonna have systems whose trace function involves um, an additive character psi and a multiplicative character chi. So at the beginning of the discussion, we'll fix a non-trivial additive character of the prime field. Um, and we'll, we'll make it allatic just by embedding the field of P-th roots of unity into QL bar. Then we get this so-called Art and Schreier sheaf, L psi, and um, its trace function on finite extensions is you just do the obvious thing. You compose your additive character with the relative trace, and that gives you an additive character of the bigger field. And that's how you get values um, on extension fields. And chi is a multiplicative character of some um, the multiplicative group of some finite extension. Um, this gives you Kummer sheaf L sub chi. And again, in a completely analogous way, you get the traces in extension fields by composing with the norm. If you have a character of the of FQ cross and you compose with the norm, you have now a character of the K cross. Okay, so when I write formulas, um, that's the sense of the psi and the chi. Okay, 
So let me start um, without being very specific here. If, if we're um, on the multiplicative group, we have these so-called hypergeometric sheaves, which are described by um, a list of um, upstairs characters, um, another list of downstairs characters. There should be fewer downstairs than upstairs. Um, and the condition on, for irreducibility um, is that nobody appears both upstairs and downstairs. And um, it can be quite delicate to decide um, if one of these things has finite monodromy or not, but there's an a priori statement that if it's gonna have finite monodromy, then um, using the correct power of the square root of Q will be the right thing to have used. Um, the right thing meaning that the, uh, if you do this twist, the determinant will be arithmetically a finite order. Um, but that doesn't have to be true. Um, that's not a generally, that's not a statement that's true in general for hypergeometric sheaves. Okay. And, um, so there's a tremendous amount that we know about these, which um, I'll only refer to implicitly a bit later. Okay. So second example um, on the affine line, we can look at local systems where I, now I'm gonna tell you explicitly what the trace function is. So this is the trace function um, from a fancy point of view, it's the, the Fourier transform of uh, an L psi of f of x tensored with an L chi of x. But because it's the Fourier transform of some rank one thing, it's um, geometrically irreducible for free, if you like. And um, at least if we restrict the, the chi to either be the trivial character, which is say, don't write it down at all, or the quadratic character, which only makes sense if we're not characteristic, then we know that, um, so this is gonna be weight one, and if we divide by root Q, then um, that's the right thing to have done. But again, um, it doesn't have to be always true. It could be, it can be false, um, even if it's x squared plus tx and you take um, some other chi, um, the arithmetic determinant um, won't be right, won't be a finite order if you use root q. Okay, that's basically saying um, that um, the product of Frobenius eigenvalues doesn't have to be um, just the, the power you think of root Q in general, but it, it's okay if chi is trivial or the quadratic character. And then a third case that you might, one might try to look at is, um, so take a hyperelliptic curve of this Y squared equals a polyno nice polynomial like this, so um, what I've written is the equation of the curve minus the single point at infinity. So it's pi one is a free group on two G generators. Um, they occur in pairs, the product of their commutators is what local monodromy is around this missing point. And um, so the, the affine coordinate ring of, of this curve is just, um, polynomials in X and Y, but subject to the relation Y squared equals um, this F. So the, the, um, the regular functions are either polynomials in X or Y times polynomials in X. So if we wanna have something that's actually on the, uh, on the curve and not just a, a trivial pullback, 
um, then we should have a, a y factor. So that's why I write y times g of x. Um, and again, um, for essentially trivial reasons, this, um, this is going to be a geometrically irreducible local system. And again, if we at least if we're careful about either having a trivial character or a quadratic character, we can use root q. Um, and it doesn't have it does matter what character you take in general. Okay, so before going on, I want to talk about um, an open problem, almost a kind of computer science problem. Um, so if we want to decide if the, the um, these groups are finite, we have to look at Frobenius traces. And we want Frobenius traces after the twist to be p integral, or equivalently to be algebraic integers. And the question is, so you start computing, um, which is say over various finite extensions of the field you started life over, you compute all the Frobenius traces and you see if they're all p integral. And so the theorem is that if if every single one of them is p integral, then you win. Now, in practice, if, if you just have some local system and you're thinking, well, I wonder if it's possibly finite, I'll do some computations. So you compute for a while and gee, all these traces are coming out to be p integral. And you know, like maybe it's that you're in characteristic two and you've gone up to, uh, the field of two to the 20th elements, that's a million. And I'd say, well, you know, how could it not be finite if you, if you have that much data? So, okay, so here's a theorem, um, but it's a useless theorem, let me explain. So, we looked at these, situations where we're over a fixed finite field and um, either we had a hypergeometric sheaf where the characters were of order dividing q minus one and there are at most n upstairs and fewer than n downstairs, or we had um, psi of a, a polynomial of degree something and maybe a character, or um, we had y times g of x, um, G had a bounded degree, the, the genus is bounded. Um, so there's only, only finally many things to look at. And I'm, what I'm saying is that there is some bound so that if you've gone up far enough, um, then you know they're all gonna be algebraic integers. And the proof is, is kind of idiotic. So there are only finitely many of these systems that you're gonna look at. Now, some have finite arithmetic group and some don't. And for each one that doesn't, um, you know that you're gonna get a non-integral trace somewhere. So look how far you had to go for each of them to get a non-integral trace. And then, okay, the, the worst degree that you needed to get a non-integral trace, it'll tell you, well, if you've gone that far and you haven't gotten an, a non-integral trace, then you're not in one of these bad cases and therefore you win. But as I say, it's useless because I mean, implicitly it's, it's saying you, you know in advance what the answer was. Okay, so the real question is in terms of the, the input data of the, the, the size of the field you're over and, and the, the degrees of some auxiliary polynomials, um, how how can you can you explicitly bound this 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 thing in terms of the the input data? I mean, even something completely horrible, triply exponential something. Of course, the ideal thing from a co computer science point of view would be have a polynomial in in something like uh, n times log q, basically the, the number of bits in the input data. And boy, do we have no idea about this. Um, I mean, one's experience is that um, you, 
well, so in this in this collaboration with with Rojas Leon and and Tiap, um, the experience has been that if we have a system which we suspect might be finite, and we do some calculations of uh, p integrality of traces, then either it fails right away, which is say we get a non-integral trace right away, or we um, we compute for a while and it looks very good. And then um, we ask Rojas Leon, uh, he can actually prove this. And um, he has 100% accuracy rate. Um, if, or we have 100% accuracy rate in giving him things which he then is able to prove are actually finite. Okay. So let me now talk about. Um, what we know and what we don't know. So let me just be briefly uh, talking about the hypergeometric case where, so I can summarize it by, by saying that um, the three of us, we, for instance, so let me, let me start by saying a, an initial um, sort of interest of looking at these things was to wonder um, if we could get any of the sporadic groups as um, monodromy groups for the hypergeometric sheaves. And um, so we've first of all figured out which of the sporadic groups could possibly occur. And I'll explain in a minute what, what could keep them from occurring. And, Every time we can prove, well, every time it's not on the list of exclusions, then we've been able to find a hypergeometric sheath that realizes it. And another thing we've done um, is looking for finite groups of Lie type. Um, which ones can you get? And uh, if you can get them, we got them. So let me just let me just say a little bit because um, it's kind of cute about the um, the sporadic group case. So anybody who knows what a sporadic group is, and you know, you, you say, well, I'm interested in hypergeometric sheaves and getting interesting monodromy groups. But right away, I say, well, how about the monster? So the problem with the monster is this. Its smallest dimensional representation is something like 1986, 63. 198, um, 1986, 60, 1968, 196,000-some. It's a huge, so we would need a hypergeometric sheet, which upstairs has 190-some thousand characters. OK. Now, when you have a hypergeometric sheaf, unless all the upstairs characters are distinct from each other, you can never have, it can't have finite monodromy because already you'll have um, non-trivial Jordan blocks. If a character upstairs occurs a few times, there'll be a Jordan block of that size. So you need all the characters upstairs to be distinct. Now, if all the characters upstairs are distinct, then um, there must be um, the order of the local monodromy generator, it's the same situation, um, has to be at least that 196 some thousand. Because if it were lower, then all the characters would be of order dividing that lower number, and they can't then all be distinct. OK. So we would have an element in the monster whose order is 196 thousand some. But the biggest order of any element in the, in the monster is, is 100 and something. 
So you're not going to get the monster. And the same condition, I mean, what it says is that if you're going to get, well, if you're going to get any group in, in say, in an n-dimensional representation from a hypergeometric, in the n-dimensional representation, there better be an element of order at least n. So that's, um, that's pretty restrictive, and it rules out a lot of the sporadic groups. And there's one sporadic group that isn't ruled out by it, um, the Higman-Sims Higman -Sims group, um, gets ruled out for another reason, which I won't go into. So, but the remaining ones, um, the one that, that we haven't ruled out, um, we, we find things that realize them. Okay, and maybe I'll say more about this later. Oop, why is it not working? I don't know. Okay, so let me talk about the um, case on the affine line. So, So here we're looking at um, the sum over x of psi of f of x plus tx with a character. Um, and if you say, well, what happens if the input is some general polynomial f? The answer is we don't know. We know a few, we know some families of polynomials which um, have this extra and very special property that if you allow all the coefficients of the polynomial to separately be independent variables, so you have a big multi-parameter family, um, if that multi-parameter family has finite monodromy, then of course the, the, the polynomial you started with does just by specializing the coefficients to the ones of your polynomial. Um, and we do, have, um, we do have a complete understanding of that situation, but um, it, that almost never, it, so to speak, statistically, it almost never applies. And, um, but right now, I think it's fair to say that in, in the general case, that's the only source we have of Fs with more than uh, two terms in them that um, where we can prove something. But the case where we can prove something is if, if this F is just a single monomial. So it's just a power of X plus TX. Okay. And so I'm gonna tell you exactly what happens, but, um, It's hypergeometric sheaves which are hiding behind these things because, so let me just say in, in words, you have one of these hypergeometric sheaves, the upstairs characters, which if we want finding this have to be all distinct anyway, um, they have some common order, um, say capital A. And if you do the, um, Kummer pullback by capital A power to this hypergeometric thing, then you've trivialized the local monodromy at the origin. In other words, you've created some kind of local system on the affine line. And this kind of local system they're writing down here with x to the a plus tx with a character even, um, those are local systems that have the property that they're in fact suitable Kummer pullbacks of hypergeometric things. And it's really from the hypergeometric story that we know that we're able to prove the things I'm gonna say now. Okay. But the statements are sort of nice in their own way. So there are two cases in this X to the A plus TX with the character um, where we get sporadic groups. Um, and you know where these numbers come from, it's, sort of a mystery. So in characteristic five, you can have X to the seven plus TX, no character. And you get this um, group called 2J2. So it's a, it's a finite subgroup of the symplectic group SP6. And um, 
it has various special properties like um, it, it mocks the, the full SP6 in having the, the same um, second, fourth, and sixth moment. Okay. Um, there's one other in this x to the a plus tx with a character case um, where we get a sporadic group, characteristic three, x to the 23 plus tx with a quadratic character, we get this Conway group CO3. Okay. And um, now this, 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 this um, 2G2 case um, was discovered by Rojas Leon um, He was looking for when um, x to the a plus tx without a character um, was going to be finite. And um, he found this case doing a computer search and checking um, integrality ex empirically first. Um, he found this case right away. And then I think he went up through characteristic 11 or 13 and degrees up to a million and he didn't find any more. And, and then he, he figured out a, a, a proof technology that um, where he was able to prove that the, 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 uh, the group was actually finite. And then um, we were able to, to prove exactly what it was. But this was one of the starting points of um, the realization that you could get interesting groups with um, kind of accessible, easy to remember uh, local systems. And then of course, a natural question, if you're um, looking at this, well, you know, what else can you get? And the answer is, um, there are four, if you like, four infinite families. Um, you can have um, the degree is, is Q plus one over two, and you're talking about SL2Q. Um, you can have degree 2Q minus one in the quadratic character, and it's the alternating group of, of size 2Q. You can have these funny fractions. Qn plus one over Q plus one, where the n is odd, so that Q plus one divides Qn plus one, and the character has to have order dividing Q plus one, and then you're you're talking about the special unitary group SUnQ. Um, Su three two is a little tiny group, and the statement would be a little different for that. Um, and then there's um, when the degree is Q plus one. Um, so this goes back to the, actually the mid 1980s, Dan Kubert um, had a technology using what became, what we started to call his V function. Actually he called it his V function, um, which proved fineness, for instance, for this, and um, at the time, Richard Pink was um, spending a year or two in Princeton, and he came up with a proof that um, the group here would be a P group. And then um, much more recently, I asked my, I guess, then student, Will Sawin, um, if he could figure out exactly what this P group was. And he figured it out that it's actually this Heisenberg group. Um, in characteristic two, it's a little bit different. And then there's um, this very degenerate case where um, you think it's, you think of um, one plus P to the F as one plus one by taking F equals zero. And then it's just, it's the cyclic group of order P. So if you like, it's the, it's the Heisenberg group of order PQ squared where Q is one. Okay, so those are the infinite cases. And then we also determined um, what the group was going to be if it wasn't finite. So the, the idea is you look, 
you look at your A, you look at your character, um, you look in your characteristic so that and you have to look at powers Q of P and you see if you're on this list. If you're on this list, you're finite. If you're not on this list, you know you're infinite. So what are you? Okay, so the statement is, it's very simple. It's a symplectic group. If it's X to an odd power and there's no character, it's the orthogonal group. If it's an odd power um, and you have the quadratic character, except there's something special with seven because when it's seven, it's G2, which is this exotic subgroup of SO7. And um, if A is still, if, if, if it's odd, but, but you haven't used the quadratic character or the trivial character, so you're not in one of the first two cases, then it's full SLA um, and it's SL sub A minus one if A is at least four. Um, and then there's some special case if A is two and then not, not trivial character. But basically the point is we know exactly what these groups are. And in some sense, th this list is kind of disappointing because um, so we're getting the sta standard classical groups, um, odd orthogonal groups, symplectic groups, special linear groups. Um, one um, exceptional Lie group G2. Sort of disappointing that um, we didn't get any other exceptional groups, but that's life. Okay. Um, right. So in the hyperliptic case, um, can be described very quickly. We don't know anything. Um, can we even, can we get by the kind of baby systems I wrote down, psi of y times g of x plus t times x, maybe with a character. Um, can we even get finite groups? Um, or suppose you, just to fix ideas, take, um, take g of x, um, a fixed polynomial g of x, but vary the, the polynomial f defining the uh, hyperelliptic curve. Um, so for each, if you like, for each different hyperelliptic curve with a fixed psi of y g of x plus tx with character, um, for each one you're getting some group, but um, does the group know, so to speak, which curve you're on? Um, if you got, if it came out finite for one, should it be finite for the others, or is that something special about that curve? Um, we just don't know anything. Okay, so let me summarize by saying much remains to be done. And I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah, may I ask a couple of naive questions? Please. Uh, so you, you said that uh, Leon had methods of proving finiteness. Could you say a little bit more about that? And in particular, I'm wondering, again, very naively, if you look at the so-called little crystalline comrades of these representations, which should be accessible since they're all so explicitly constructed and possibly relate stuff to P curvature. All right, so um, let me answer the first question first. Um, right, so in the case of hypergeometric sheaves and also in the case of um, this psi of a polynomial, um, if the polynomial has all its coefficients independent variables, so it's a multi-parameter system, um, or with hypergeometric sheaves, in both cases, you have a criterion which is completely in terms of piatic ordinals of various um, products 
of Gal Sams. Gal Sams with different characters. Okay. Now, what Kubrick realized in, in the mid 80s um, was that if you use, uh, well, Kubrick just used sort of formal properties of ords of Gal Sams um, that followed from classical identities of Gal Sams to be able to prove his thing. And um, there's something called Stickelberger's theorem, which is a formula for the piatic word of a Gal Sam in terms of um, some. I'm hearing some strange noises. Am I? Uh, can you hear me in there? We, we, we can hear you. I hear the noise. Hear they're, 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 yeah, I can hear you, but the noises are minimal. Don't worry about it. Okay, fine. Um, okay, so basically the um, the Stiffelberger idea is this: you take your multiplicative character of of an FQ, and you express it as a power of the Teichmuller character. Okay, so that power is is a number mod Q minus one, and you you of course represent it as an integer between zero and Q minus two. And the Stickelberger formula is in terms of the piatic digits of that integer. Okay. And what, what Rojas Leon has is a, um, if you like, a, a, an incredible ability to turn this um, Stickelberger formula, which expresses things in terms of digits, and see what happens as you, um, as the finite field grows in such a way that um, he can get statements which, in every case where it succeeds, he manages to find an inductive structure, so to speak, with these digits that allows the, um, the finiteness to be proved. But we've, he and I have discussed whether, um, whether you can actually describe it as an algorithm. So relative to the, relevant to this computer science question. And um, the answer so far is no, that every time you, so to speak, never know when you're gonna get to a point where you can start having an inductive structure. <laughs> Okay. That's how he describes the situation. So while it, it seems like it should be true, um, it's, it's just wide open now. And now the second question, um, the answer is A, I don't know, and B, um, it had never occurred to me to even think about this, but um, sure, it seems like an obvious question to ask, and I don't know. Uh, Okay, any other questions? If not, then let's uh, thank the speaker again.